and welcome back to Choose That Dobses from Valencia. Just pick this up. Johnny Walker, black label, scotch. Now the funny thing about this is, it's usually cheaper to buy this stuff in Spain than it is in the UK. Mm. Delicious. Thank you always everyone for getting in touch. Best place to do so, comment section below, which I always find very useful reading through. On top of that, if it's a longer story, hi at choosedatdobs.com to email and Instagram Tuesday underscore at underscore Dobbs. I'll begin this week with a quote that just popped up on my Instagram feed. I love this one. I haven't heard it in a while. It's from Hunter S. Thompson. Life has become immeasurably better since I've been forced to stop taking it seriously quote to live by. I begin. Let me start off just with a, a little, a little insight here from John. It coincides with something I've seen on YouTube this week. Freddie, listened to the comments with regards to BMWs in particular. I've ridden considerable mileage on the BMW RS 1200 Sport. Fabulous smiles on lots of miles. I'm now on the new 1250 RS. Why have BMW felt it necessary to put a keyless fuel cap on a real staple of the range? If it doesn't work, it will not open. You have to take two bolts out to fill the tank. This is going to happen at a time when you just want to fill and go. So my question is, are there any other examples of over-engineered unnecessary development? My own bikes are all over 20 years old. That's a 2002 BMW R1100S, 2002 Aprilia RSV Miller, regards John. You know, John, hmm. I had something pop up on YouTube. On YouTube, it was a female rider and she was, she was doing a video Pulled up to a petrol station on one of the BMWs. I just can't remember which, which YouTuber it was. Anyway, she was trying to fill up and she couldn't open the tank to fill up with fuel for the BMW. Had to get three or four people around her and still no one could open the tank to fill up with fuel. It took four people. I don't think I watched to the end of the video. I had to quickly pop out so I didn't find out what happened. But last point I remember, four people around this BMW trying to open the tank. In my view, John, probably yes, they are becoming slightly too complicated. I move on. Motorcycles, motorcycle warranties. This generated a lot of discussion. So I've tried to condense down all of your thoughts and opinions into the next couple of minutes or so. And before I go ahead with this, to summarize, I thought I'd do a summary first on this. It seems that the vast majority of people seem to think that at least after market warranties, so not from the main dealer, are very probably not worth the money. If you get it from a main dealer, an extended warranty, BMW, Royal Enfield, etc., etc., the common consensus seems to be that is worth the money. However, that's not always the case. But almost always the case is people seem to think aftermarket warranties, forget it. I begin from Alex. Freddie, I have a Triumph approved warranty on my Triumph Speed Triple RS. The gearbox failed within 100 miles. Fourth gear broke. It was a nightmare to get repaired. The Triumph approved warranty is not actually Triumph, but an aftermarket car warranty. I had to fight like mad to get my bike repaired. The fault is a known fault on Triumph gearboxes, but still I had to fight. The repair when it was done cost over £2,000 as the entire gearbox was rebuilt. My bike had only done 1,200 miles at the time. Completely unacceptable. I move on to user HL6. Freddie, I've got a Royal Enfield Classic 350 that I service myself. This will save about £1,000 on servicing costs as it's unlikely that any potential warranty claims will amount to this. Now this is a common thread. A lot of people say they buy a new bike and just trust that the money they will save on just immediately buying it, servicing it themselves, in essence, voiding the manufacturer warranty, 
but taking a gamble that a new bike isn't going to break down and the money you save on servicing it yourself will completely compensate for the money that you may potentially lose on any repair bills because the chances are there won't be any repair bills on a new bike. I continue from Darren. Freddie, I've got a Himalayan that's just come up to two years old and the wiring loom is shot. I've since been told it's not covered as it's corrosion. The fact that it's a major component and has failed means nothing to Royal Enfield. So I'm arguing this with them at the moment. I move on, tall biker. Freddie, did you notice the Sinus seven year warranty? A lot of people pulled me up on this. The Sinus seven year warranty is only for parts. You only get one year labor warranty. After that, you've got to pay the labor costs. Someone else replied, yep. For example, a new crankcase bearing or new crankcase bearings aren't really that expensive. Putting them in, however, another matter. With regards to Sinus's seven year warranty that I mentioned last week, Sinus very cleverly lay everything out, crystal clear, but you only get one year labor warranty. And on a very simple 125cc bike, parts are going to be completely inexpensive you're probably not going to have to spend more than 50 pounds for most parts for your Sinus, with, well, regardless what it is. So it'll be the labor costs that account for the vast majority of any repair bills. So really the fact that the labor and parts warranty is only for the first year, or the labor for the, is only for the first year, means that for the next six years of warranty, yes, you get the parts, but what are you really going to save? 50 quid here or there, you still got to pay probably 70 to 80 pounds an hour for the engineers to actually potentially take the bike apart and put in that 20 pound part for the motorbike. Point well taken. Moving on, CP45. You're about right, or you're right about aftermarket warranties. All have max hourly rates, i.e. ridiculously low. Big excesses, and maximum payouts for each repair, which is well below what any mechanic would actually charge. The only warranty worth having is extended or is extending the original manufacturers. And that is without question the most common advice that everyone's giving here. Manufacturer original warranty, fine. Anything else, just forget it. Now the conversation takes a turn because uh, this is, again, something I completely overlooked. So have a listen to a few bikers here from Europe, or from the EU, I should say, and Australia. Critical rider over in the EU. Freddie, in the EU countries, the minimum warranty is three years for large items, such as cars and motorcycles and washing machines. I guess you're looking at the UK websites, which presum presumably don't follow EU law. Dave continues, Freddie, I'm from Australia and purchased a new Suzuki V-Strom 650 earlier this year. The service intervals are actually 12,000 kilometers or once a year. Now Suzuki gives a two year warranty in Australia with a bonus third year if you have the bike serviced at Suzuki. As someone pointed out in the comments, we are fortunate in Australia that we have the Australian Consumer Rights Law that in effect makes manufacturer's warranty periods irrelevant. Okay, get ready for this. I will probably have my bike serviced at my Suzuki dealer as they have a good reputation. However, the consumer law would protect me until well outside of the warranty period, irrespective of which shop does the servicing. Now, CPUK continues with this. Warranty just means less hassle for when they do go wrong, but you can still fall back on the Consumer Rights Act 2015 if you have to. This is where things get interesting. I'll do a backstory on this. I bought the brand new iPhone about, well, it was about a year and a half ago now. But after one year and two months, the camera completely broke and iPhones come with a standard in the UK one year warranty. Mine broke two months out of warranty. So I went back to Apple, a proper Apple store, and I said, my camera's broken. 
I know it's out of warranty period, but this is just not acceptable for such an expensive piece of equipment. I expected Apple to come back to me and say, sorry, Freddie, it's out of warranty. But instead of that, what Apple came back to me and said is, Freddie, you're covered by the Consumer Rights Act. So actually, we will have to repair your phone. So I left it with them for a week and a half. And even though it was out of the Apple warranty, because it was still under the UK consumer white rights protection, Apple for free still repaired my phone. So that brings me to the point. What's the point? Is there any point in taking out Apple's extended two year warranty when actually you're covered by the UK consumer rights? And I still haven't quite figured that out in my head and in my head until reading all of your input on this. So I'm going to carry on with this. Have a listen to this. This is from Europa.eu and I'm quoting here. I'm going to do EU first, then UK. EU law stipulates that you must give the consumer a minimum two year guarantee, legal guarantee, as a protection against faulty goods or goods that don't look or work as advertised. In some countries, national law may require you to provide longer guarantees. So EU law states two years minimum. Next up, gov.uk for the UK. And I'm quoting again, accepting returns and giving refunds. Bear in mind, this is gov.uk outlining for businesses, for companies, how they need to treat consumers. Here's the guidelines. You must offer a full refund if an item is faulty, not as described or does not do what it's supposed to do. Under repairs and replacements, if a customer has accepted an item but later discovers a fault, you may have to repair or replace it. The customer can still reject the item after it's been repaired or replaced. Customers have up to six years to make a claim for an item they've bought with you. Now listen to the final bit here. Warranties and guarantees. A customer has the same right to free repairs or a replacement regardless of whether they have a warranty or guarantee or not. So you may still have to repair or replace goods if a customer's warranty or guarantee has run out. So my question to that, is there any need at all in warranties? Does it actually mean anything when in essence we're covered by whether it's UK, Australian, EU consumer law that at the very least from what I've seen for two years, our consumer law protects us and means that all of these parts have to be replaced. It's, it's almost not a case of BMW, Triumph, Honda giving these warranties because we're covered under our consumer laws anyway. And it looks very much like in the UK, that may even stretch to six years. I welcome anyone's opinion on that. I'll change the subject now completely. Small bikes. This came in from Sean. Freddie, there's a lot of comment in the motorcycling press about performance, comfort, reliability, and all the objective ways of measuring a bike. There's very little focus on how they make you feel. I've done more than 35,000 miles in my Triumph Tiger 1200S. They are objectively almost perfect adventure touring bikes. Last year, my daughter was 18 and with an A1 license, she wanted to go touring and taking the big Triumph at 125cc speeds would have been frustrating. So I bought a cheap secondhand Mutt Hiltz 250. Together we went through Northern Europe, across the Alps several times. In fact, I've got these pics. Let me put these pics up now as I speak. We went across the Alps several times around the Italian lakes and back over the Stelvio Pass on tiny bikes which were hardly intended for the purpose, whilst the Triumph gathered dust in the garage. We barely got over 60 miles an hour, but the experience taught me two things. Firstly, if you want to go touring, just use the bike you've got. You might want aluminium luggage, heated seats, an electric screen, and lean sensitive traction control, but you don't need it. Secondly, measure bikes by the size of smiles on your face and nothing else. Incidentally, 
I sold the mat a few months later for more than I bought it for and had no problems with it at all. Continuing the theme of bikes making people smile. In the autumn, we bought a dog. A sidecar seemed logical to me, if no one else that I've ever spoken to. I had a very lucky find of a Royal Enfield slash... Ah, slash Watsonian outfit. So I think Watsonian is the sidecar outfit. Picks right up here right now. With a bit of training and careful thought to keep him safe, I now go everywhere with Louis, my Dalmatian. The looks, I love these pics. I was enjoying these about half an hour ago. The looks we get and the constant smiles and thumbs up from complete strangers are brilliant. I do have another bike, a CCM Spitfire, but the sidecar gets the most use. Bikes should be an emotional decision. If all we do is measure things objectively, bikes will have all the passion of washing machines. I think you're completely right, Sean. You've made my day looking at those pics, it's brilliant. And also to go touring like that with your 18 year old daughter on those two bikes, you'll never ever forget that. Memories that will last a lifetime. Moving on to servicing now. This kind of goes hand in hand with warranties to an extent. Here are a few people's thoughts on this. Triumphs 10,000 miles service intervals for many are completely irrelevant because to maintain the warranty of Triumph, your bike has to be serviced every 12 months regardless of mileage. This is a really good point that a lot of people made. It sounds like a really good sales pitch, 10,000 mile intervals of Triumphs, but you also have to service it 10,000 miles or every year. And I would guess or suggest that only 5% maximum of bikers actually do 10,000 miles in a year. So the reality is it won't actually help you with needing to service it. From Jab Jab, maintenance issues, be careful here. I know someone at Ford and they laugh at this. The intervals for servicing are designed to have the vehicles last for the warranty period. It's not about keeping the vehicle running per perpetually. Quite the opposite. He still recommends oil changes every three to 5,000 miles, regardless of what the service book says. I apply, I apply this thinking to my Triumph. Oil changes are not super cheap, but 10,000 miles on a motorbike, it's just insane. Also, there's a time schedule and most vehicles with very high intervals hit the same time schedule before the mileage schedule. So that backs up K initially. Moving on to Colin. My local Triumph dealer charges $280 for a basic service for my Triumph Trophy SE. In total, it costs me $70 for oil and filter. My 32,000 kilometer valve clearance was get ready, 2,000 Canadian dollars, which is 10% of the cost of the bike. I've had a lot of Triumph owners here saying that the, the valve service, valve clearance, valve check, whatever it is, hideously expensive, hideously expensive on Triumphs. Moving on to Kevin. Freddie, I'm the owner of a BMW R1200 GS 2018 and a Triumph America 865 from 2008. The Triumph I service myself as it's easy to do so. I also enjoy doing it. The BMW I do the interim 6,000 mile service as I cannot justify paying 300 pounds for an oil and filter change. The 12,000 mile service is around 400 to 450 pounds. This is shocking giving services are only inspection with oil and filter changes included. When inspected, i.e. valve clearances, if found to require adjusting, that is an extra fee, as is anything else found needed during inspection. I cannot understand how companies call them services when they are clearly inspections. Money spinners is all that services are. I'm hearing so many people saying they, they just do their own servicing. They, they forget all about the warranty side of things and they service it regardless of warranty. They forget about 
or all about servicing packages that can be offered and anything else that can be offered and keep it simple. Wherever you can do it yourself, just service it yourself, maintain it yourself because you're going to save so much money. I continue, Anton, Freddie, get this, Triumph Tiger 1200, 20,000 mile valve adjustment and approximately 800 to 1,100 pounds, depending on which dealer you use. Seems they have to virtually take the bike to pieces, well, all the plastic off and everything else. Apparently, it's eight hours labor, valve adjustment checks. What if you're feeling physically sick by the idea of an expensive Triumph valve clearance check, or any brand for that matter? How about a Harley? Because the new Revolution Max engine from Harley Davidson, I'm quoting here from Hot Cars, with regards to the Revolution Max engine from Harley, no adjustment or no valve adjustment ever. That's the promise made by the latest Revolution Max engine, thanks to the hydraulic valve lash adjusters. They are self-adjusting, no maintenance needed ever. So you can save a thousand pounds a time if you look at one of these Harleys. It's incredible. Moving on. This will affect almost all of us. Uh, it will affect all of us. Interest rate rises hindering a bike purchase or for all of us hindering bike purchases. This is from the bearded buffoon. Freddie, I'm a 29 year old man who's been interested in bikes since I was 13. For some reason or another, or another, I've never been able to buy one. However, for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm at a stage where I can finally get my license and buy my first bike. Or so I thought. I just had a mortgage appointment today for my renewal, and I found out that due to increasing interest rates, my weekly mortgage bill would be about 300 a month more. I hope you mean monthly mortgage bill, but if you mean weekly, huge. Monthly, colossal, but 300, uh, 300, my weekly mortgage bill will be about 300 a month more. Okay, must mean a month. Will be about 300 a month more. Still huge. I was planning on buying a new Royal Enfield Super Meteor 650 next year, but I feel now it's not feasible with my increased mortgage rate and general cost of living crisis. What are some good alternatives that I could look at or that I could look into? My essential criteria. One, it must be comfortable on motorways. Two, I don't know why I'm pointing. Monica won't put these questions up. I'll put the pictures up in a second of my suggestion. One, it must be comfortable on motorways. Two, it must be able to handle a pillion passenger. And thirdly, it has to be cool. Thanks to the bearded buffoon. I have an immediate answer to this, the bearded buffoon, but you echo what so many people will be feeling right now. It's almost a shame. Bikes very often are a luxury. And when things get tough, the luxury often ends up going, but it's so important for all of us to maintain that fun, that little bit of passion in our lives, regardless how difficult things get, because if we start taking away all of those passionate elements, sometimes all that we can be left with is existing. So it's very important not to give up on your hope of biking, but to find a solution. I often say this to people, everyone's different with their financial situation. So you just have to budget for a vehicle that you know you can keep because the worst situation you can be in is buying a bike where you're overstretching because overstretching will make you resent the bike. So you've got a great attitude here. I can't remember off the top of my head, but let's say the super meteor is around six and a half to 7,000 pounds sterling. I need to go much less than this with you because there's no point in showing your bike for two grand less or so, because it's not a big enough difference. I had to look the bearded buffoon for no more than one and a half minutes, and I found you the bike. I haven't just found you a bike that you may consider. I found you a bike that I believe there is nothing else that will come close to what you're looking for. I think this is perfect in every way. I truly believe you must call this number and buy this bike because this will tick every box you dreamt the super meter would tick with no downsides at all. 
here it is. Facebook Marketplace in the UK right now, call up and buy this bike. 3,300 pounds, 2010 Triumph Speedmaster 865. It will have more power than the Super Meteor. It's probably finished. I haven't checked the Super Meteor yet, but to a slightly higher standard, it's got the 865cc engine, which I have in my Bonneville, completely unbreakable. I know I've been waiting for a gasket, but that isn't specifically reliability related, it's lack of parts related. Believe me, these are unbreakable, completely unstressed, unremarkable bikes in many ways because there's nothing market leading about them, but they are superb tools. They're workhorses, they look brilliant. And this, at this price, it seems to be about seven to 800 cheaper than I'm finding in other places. Buy this off this private seller immediately. Someone will buy this within the next three days, I promise you. Let me read this. The seller's called Matt. 2010 Triumph Speedmaster 865. Only 6,000 miles. Recently serviced. MOT until January 2024. Rides very well. Cheap on insurance. My Bonneville insurance a year, I think it's 60 or 80 a year. It's the cheapest bike I've ever owned. I also have two sets of springs, all original extras, including backrest. Backrest for pillion comfort. There will be nothing more comfortable than this. Drag bars, etc., etc. Full V5 logbook in my name. Three owners, including myself, open to trade or partex for a small car or van. Elegance personified that bike. You, you need look no further. I cannot emphasize how much I truly believe that is your bike over the Super Meteor. If you buy it, send me a pic. I've got to share it on here. Good luck, happy shopping. That's the one for you. I move on. Final point for the week, bike of the week. This was sent in and I'm so, so sorry for not saving your name. Someone sent me this about two weeks ago and I've only just got around to, to talking about it now. It's a bike that us Brits may not have heard of before. It's the Honda XL. It's the Honda, apologies, it's a bit of a mouthful, mouthful Honda XLV 750R. I must read this from Wikipedia because I find it has a fascinating background. Wikipedia, the Honda XLV 750R is a dual sport motorcycle manufactured from 1983 to 1986 by Honda Motor Company Japan. The XLV was initially intended for the European market with the exception of the UK but from 1985 on, it was also sold in Australia and New Zealand. Honda had intended the XLV to be a tourer with limited off-road capabilities. It is therefore hard to understand why Honda presented the motorbike to the press on a motocross track on the island of Ibiza, Spain, in the spring of 1983. In the early 1980s, most dual sport motorcycles had only one cylinder and weighed 120 to 150 kilos. Compared to them, the XLV, with its 220 kilo fully fueled weight, seemed to be unfit for sporty off-road riding. At the launch, several journalists crashed the heavy bike on the motocross track, for which it was entirely unsuited. The XLV 750R was Honda's first dual sport motorcycle with two non-parallel cylinders. It has an air-cooled V-twin engine with hydraulic valve tappets and shaft drive. Those two construction features make the XLV a very low maintenance motorcycle. Okay, so we know we're not gonna find one of these in the UK. So why do I even mention it? Well, when this person sent this to me on Instagram, I thought it's one of the most beautiful looking dual sport bikes I've ever seen. It's stunningly well designed. It's heavy. I have hardly sold it to you as a bike to go out and buy. But if we're being completely honest, does it even matter how good a bike is anymore? Isn't it all about the way it makes us feel? And this bike, just looking at it, oh, it makes me feel brilliant. I really want to buy this bike. One option for you, if you're a Brit, is to go on to theparking-motorcycle.co.uk because this is where you can see the foreign bikes. 
Look at the likes of France, Italy, Germany, places like this, and I can very quickly find one. Advertised in France for £2,300 for a lovely looking XL750. Blue, white and red paintwork. 63,000 kilometres, but it's a Honda, so it's built to last forever. And it is situated somewhere in the, the south of France level with Nice and Monaco, so it won't have had much rain at all. It looks superb. Go down to France, have a holiday, buy this for £2,300, pay the 30% import duties, which will equate to around about £800. And for, let's say, once you've got it sorted in the UK, including the purchase price, let's say maximum £3,500, and you've had well, I was going to say you've had a holiday in France. You've paid for that separately. But three and a half thousand pounds and you can have a Honda XL 750R in your British garage. But final thing to finish on here. If you want to keep things simpler, I found one and it is just one for sale on Facebook Marketplace that was imported from Ireland. Ireland could be a good choice actually for one of these. It's a 1986 model, it's £6,000. So you can save money buying on the continent, but you'll save a lot of hassle buying here. It's £6,000, it looks completely stunning. And I'll share the pics as I read this description. It's a 1986 model, this is an interesting description. Honda XL V 750R, Irish import, as not sold in the UK. The forerunner to the Africa Twin. This was Ped Baker's deputy editor of MCN, former Project Bike, which I have owned since 2010. A year's MOT just obtained. In three years, it will be tax and MOT exempt. Huge selling point. Recently had two new tyres, rear Hagon shock and carb, and uh, sorry, recent Hagon shock and a carb and ignition system overhaul. Eye-catching RC, uh, HRC paintwork, with one storage blemish on the tank. 750 CCV twin, three hydraulic valves per cylinder, handmade stainless exhaust with super trap silencers. Please PM to view it on the Isle of Wight. It comes with a large amount of secondhand parts which have to go with the bike, only selling it as it isn't being used enough. Pictures added May 2023, showing the parts that come with the bike. May consider part exchange. My Lord, I want that bike and I'll end it there. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Please do all have a fantastic week. I'll see you all in the next one.